Good evening and welcome. You're watching the 7 o'clock news on CNC3. I'm Ria Rambali. The study was making the news tonight. A caregiver at the St. Jude's home for girls is ambushed during a daring attempt to escape. Scrap iron dealers strongly reject government's plan to temporarily shut down the industry. They are unfounded, they are reckless, they are evil, they are malicious, and they are intended to stop the government from engaging in a very important national exercise for all citizens. Public Utilities Minister attempts to wash away what he says are opposition lies. Police hope the discovery of the murder weapon will lead them to Kareen Ramlal's killer. And now, Jassy Marik, with sport for this evening, here's our top story. With no time to cry over their India series defeat, the West Indies T20 team must now focus on avoiding the same on New Zealand's visit to the Caribbean. A tropical wave is on the horizon, and could it bring more flooding rainfall? Join me, Clay Hussein, for the details in tonight's weather forecast. Caregivers at the St. Jude's Home for Girls are begging the state for protection after a worker was attacked by residents on Saturday. CNC3 News understands that in an attempt to escape, two girls hit a caregiver twice on her head, causing serious injury. The Ministry of Gender Affairs and Child Development is investigating, and Akash Samaru has the details. These are the wounds inflicted on a caregiver at the intake house of the St. Jude's Home for Girls. The blood that you saw is a result of two blows to the head, the incident having occurred on Saturday evening. CNC3 News was told the victim was supervising 13 girls at the intake house when two asked to use the washroom. Our source said on exiting the bathroom door behind the caregiver, they snuck up behind her and dealt the woman two blows to the head, one with a pot, the other with a toilet tank cover. Now the pot was really a vase recently used as decorations for an emancipation day function while the toilet tank cover seems to be a weapon of choice there because a toilet tank cover was used to damage someone at another facility at St. Jude's in the past. Now that house no longer has covers on their tanks. Now CNC3 News was told the girls demanded keys for the gate to escape through the back. But when they failed to knock the woman unconscious, they then tried to lock the doors. But they couldn't after the victim crawled to the doorway and alerted security. We understand that now she is in a lot of pain and experienced massive blood loss and hospital staff had to wait for it to subside before she could be stitched up. But while she's on the mend, workers at St. Jude's are furious. This intake house where this brutal act occurred deals with new residents, many of whom came from violent backgrounds who are now adjusting to restrictions at the home. One person told us the workers are not trained to deal with violent children and management is ignoring that. That's why there's such a high turnover of staff. They are demanding that the state intervenes. So we reached out to Minister Ayana Webster-Roy who said that the necessary therapeutic interventions will be made available and she will be working with St. Jude's to improve safety and security. We asked for specifics but got no response. Akash Samaru, CNC3 News. Meanwhile, the Children's Authority says it is working with the home and the police with regards to this incident. The authority says it condemns all acts of violence against staff. The Trinidad and Tobago Scrap Iron Dealers Association is outrightly rejecting government's proposal to shut down their industry for six months. In protest, they are planning a motorcade from South Trinidad to Port of Spain on Saturday. Otto Carrington tells us more in this report, including how the dealers are trying to catch the culprits themselves. The fight is continuing with the Trinidad and Tobago Scrap Iron Dealers Association and the government, with the association taking action in their own hands, with a motorcade from the Bran Lara Stadium in Toruba to Port of Spain on Saturday. Speaking to the media at Jenny's on the Boulevard, President Alan Ferguson says that this motorcade is to save the industry. I will let the government know that this industry employs a lot of people. So this on Saturday, I want you to know that we will have a rally where we will invite all the trade union movements, all, all right-thinking people in Trinidad to save this industry. Mr. Ferguson says that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has failed his association and the citizens. He noted that in the coming weeks, he is expected to launch a 24-hour hotline number to allow citizens to call and complain about copper line theft. We will have a hotline 
And the hotline is that you will call us 24 hours. And if they don't want to hear, when we call them, because you call them and they ain't hearing y'all, when we call them and they don't want to answer, we will expose them. We will expose the area which we had called. He added that the plans of the government to shut down the industry for six months will cripple many citizens financially. It have things that might happen in Trinidad. Is you to be blamed for that? Because think about it. A lot of people is going to suffer. A lot of people who was in crime before they come to us might end up back into crime, and we don't want that. The association is calling on the government to return to the table for dialogue as they want to ensure the survival of the scrap iron industry. Otto Carrington, CNC3 News. The Public Utilities Minister is tonight setting the record straight over what he says are the lies peddled by the opposition regarding the restructuring of WASA. Just yesterday, opposition MP Dr. Rudal Munilal claimed government entered into a secret agreement with a foreign company to transform the authority. Well, Minister Marvin Gonzalez said not only are the statements misleading, but the opposition also previously failed to honor their plans to overhaul the organization. Here's Jesse Ramdeo with more. Details outlined by opposition MP Dr. Rudal Munilal about the restructuring of the Water and Sewage Authority are being flushed down the drain. They are unfounded, they are reckless, they are evil, they are malicious, and they are intended to stop the government from engaging in a very important national exercise for all citizens. At a press conference on Sunday, Dr. Munilal claimed that government was partnering with the foreign company to transform WASA and that managers were being trained to replace those being axed. Gonzalez not only refuted the claims, but went a step further. He referenced a loan agreement during the People's Partnership's tenure between former WASA CEO Ganga Singh and the Inter-American Development Bank aimed at restructuring WASA. Gonzalez said the terms were never honored. The UNC government received a loan from the IDB, IADB to the tune of $396 million so as to commence the restructuring of the Water and Sewage Authority. And by 2015, as opposed to having a staff level of 2,400 employees, the staffing level was further increased to 5,000 employees. Gonzalez believes that by breaching the conditions of the loan, the country was placed in a disadvantageous position. I am certain that it damaged the reputation of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and the country before the eyes of international organizations like the IDB and CAF. Gonzalez also contended that the leaked backlog figure outlined by Dr. Monilal was inflated and assured that it will be reduced to zero by the end of September. Jesse Ramde, OCNC 3 News. In other news, two police officers appeared before a Port of Spain magistrate today charged with the murder of PC Clarence Jilks on April 22nd. PC Christian Genty was charged with murder and shooting with intent, while WPC Crystal Williams Bowman was charged with shooting with intent. Genty was remanded into custody while Williams Bowman was granted $500,000 bail. The magistrate approved Williams Bowman's bail bond, but she did not consider bail for Genty for the lesser offense, as his lawyer, senior counsel Israel Khan, said he would apply for bail for both charges before a high court judge at a later date. The matter is adjourned to September 5th, 2022. Still to come in the news, we'll tell you why, after 17 years, this family is being evicted from their last Quavers home. It's a CNC3 News exclusive. Investigative lead editor Mark Bassant brings us part two of a contentious land dispute in Peparo. In a matter of hours, a Las Cuevas family will be on the streets. Cherry Ann Cox, a mother of three, including a child with cerebral palsy, has until tomorrow to vacate their home for the last 17 years. The family told CNC3 News. They were given permission to occupy the property. However, it was sold, and the new owner is now ordering them out. Otto Carrington tells us more in this report. 
Cherry Ann Fox and her family's story of dismay and horror started in 2019. It was at that time they were served a notice of eviction from their last Cuevas home. The family lived at the said property for the last 17 years. This permission, they said, was given by the previous owner. However, the property has now been sold, and they say the new owner is not recognizing their right. Sherry Ann, her husband Kevin, and their three children, including one of them with cerebral palsy, are calling for help. Well, we was living here at first, and then after the owner came, and he gave us permission to occupy this lot of land here. That is how we get current, and that is how we pay in for water bills now. Armed with the water and electrical bills, and the only document that gave them permission, she claims that she never got summoned to court. Well, I want justice because I live in here too long. I never get any summons or anything to come to court. And I gain all these, all these set of documents. And now they're telling me how, till any morning, to move out my place. Cherry Ann and her family have started demolishing the home in preparation for the court martials. She noted that now with the heavy rain, they are now faced with another challenge. Inside my house, leaking. Because they tell me that they come like I have to break my thing. If I break my thing, they come in and they, they come like them will be ending up with my thing. CNC3 News contacted a new owner, Mr. Yunanan Passad, who said that everything he did was above board. He petitioned the court and the order was granted for the family to be removed. Otto Carrington, CNC3 News. A hammer police believe was used to kill Karine Ramlal was found right next to her body. They hope it can provide clues about who committed the murder. Ramlal's decomposing body was found in Penal on Sunday, six days after she went missing. Her murder occurred eight months after she was released from prison, having served a short sentence for the murder of her abusive husband, Anil Jadu. She was accused of poisoning and then bludgeoning him to death in 2014 with the help of two others. Ramlal's daughter, Carrie Ann, said she was having a difficult time accepting that her mother will never come back. A man with whom Ra Ramlal was last seen remains on the run. The Hunter's search and rescue team led by Captain Valence Rambarat were instrumental in locating her body. Rambarat said it was distressing to know that a young working mother was killed in such a heinous manner. A hammer was found close by together with a bottle of perfume and an empty beer bottle. And um, really and truly, I must say that it was for the first time one of our members broke down and cried. It was appeared to be a murder, most heinous and gruesome. And one can just imagine what would have been the final moments of the person who was murdered. Ramlal worked as a security guard and had started putting her life back together after being in prison for almost eight years. After finishing work on Sunday, Ramlal went to meet a friend in Penal, but never returned. Police are still trying to identify a cyclist who was killed during a road accident at the San Fernando Bypass last night. Around 10.30 p.m., 40-year-old Ravi Sukdeo of San Fernando was driving north along the bypass when, upon reaching the old drive-in cinema, he tried to overtake and collided with a cyclist. Fortunately, Sukdeo escaped injuries, but the entire front of his car was damaged. So the cyclist died at the scene. Corporal Simon of the Marabella Police Station is continuing investigations. In tonight's Business Watch, Massey Motors' Volvo sales for the first half of the year have been hailed by the franchise. While Chile hopes to expand trade with Trinidad and Tobago, Peter Christopher reports. The following Business Watch feature is brought to you by Visa, everywhere you want to be. Massimoto Trinidad and Tobago has been hailed by Volvo International after sales of Volvos in Trinidad and Tobago grew by more than 80% for the first half of 2022 compared to the same period in 2021. These results were boasted by sales of Volvo's XC40 and XC90 models. These models hit the number one sales spots in their segments, C SUV and ESUV respectively, with more than 20 units sold. 
Volvo's brand manager at the Massey Motors Group, Veer Sinarain, says these results indicate that we are walking to the right place. Our customers are very open to buying our hybrids and fully electric cars. We are very happy to share this news and celebrate a new moment of the brand. Touchstone Explorations operations within the Cascadura area of the Ottawa block are set to move forward after the Environmental Management Authority confirmed that no further information is required concerning the Cascadura Environmental Impact Assessment. The EIA supports the company's application for a certificate of environmental clearance to conduct development operations within the Cascadura area. President and Chief Executive Officer of Touchstone, Paul Bay, says... We are excited that the EME has accepted our EIA documentation and will process our CEC application in the near future. Chile is seeking to expand its trade relationship with Trinidad and Tobago through ProChile. ProChile is an institution within the South American country's Ministry of Foreign Affairs geared towards promoting the country's goods and service exports. Pro Chile director Liz Rivas de Ginibra explains in 2021, 264 million US dollars worth of exports were sent from Trinidad and Tobago to Chile. But there is room for more trade. It is possible to build a value change between Chile and Trinidad and Tobago so that Trinidad and Tobago could take advantage of the benefits that Chile offers through its extensive network free trade agreements. Trinidad and Tobago could also increase its export from a supplier fertilizer and other agricultural products. The Christopher CNC3 Business Watch. The preceding Business Watch feature was brought to you by Visa. Everywhere you want to be. But still to come in the news, Thelma Clark reveals the many secrets that got her to the 100-year mark. Good Monday evening, everyone. Across Trinidad and Tobago today, most people experience some sunshine with the intervals of cloudy skies and even isolated showers. We saw street flooding develop across northwestern Trinidad, associated with some heavy showers, and then a persisting area of thunderstorms develop across southwestern Trinidad, which caused quite a bit of flooding. I'll have the details on where it was affected and what weather we can expect with an approaching tropical wave later in the newscast. Welcome back, everyone. A local artist is petitioning the airport's authority to give small entrepreneurs who promote TNT's culture a space at the Piaco International Airport. Artist and designer Esther Sunrise Marcano says more local art and cuisine needs to be showcased. She says the airport is one of the easiest places to take TNT to foreign nationals. I believe that is the place where more of our culture, more of our art, more of our lifestyle, more of us, our southern nation could become much more seen on an international scale. It is where tourism is flourishing because persons are always coming in, coming out. She says she intends to take the petition to the airport's authority and the tourism ministry to make the project happen. The voice of the people is in the multitude of many. So the more persons sign this petition is the more turn all our voices be heard. The more we could, we will make it happen in that we signed it and we come together and say, hey, we're really encouraging this. We would, really would love this. Well, the petition can be found on change.org or on Esther Marcano's Instagram page. CNC3 News reached out to the airport's authority for a comment and is still awaiting a response. <laughs> Now time for the weather forecast with Colleen Hussein and Colleen it seems as though all the weekends good weather gone yep we have the rains again and it came 
torrentially heavy across southwestern parts of Trinidad. They dealt with a lot of street and flash flooding. It did rain in the capital, but we were spared the flood. So let's go take a look at where it was affected. We had lots of flooding in Point Fortin, all the way down to Ecarcus, and then coming up north to the South Arapuche area. As a persistent area of thunderstorms developed from around 1 p.m. and continued all the way until 5 p.m. today, that amount of rainfall fell in a short period of time, caused a lot of drains and even smaller streams to, be, streams to become overwhelmed, and that caused street and flash flooding. Thankfully, no reports of injuries, but it did cause quite a bit of traffic backup along the southern main road. Now we shift to the tropics where the National Hurricane Center has tagged a tropical wave with the medium chances of development over the next five days, giving it 40%. Now it's producing a cluster of showers and thunderstorms just off the Cabo Verde Islands, and it's moving well to the west-northwest over the next several days, the National Hurricane Center says we could see a tropical depression form by the middle to the end of this week. But the question is always, how can this affect Trinidad and Tobago? And the good news is, as this system moves towards the Lesser Antilles right here, wind shear is forecast to pick up and really rip the system apart. So the most we'll be seeing will be a decrease in winds across Trinidad and Tobago. That will allow for light winds and with high moisture available, we'll be seeing the afternoon showers and thunderstorms, mainly by this weekend. Now taking a look at what else is going on across the Atlantic, we have a tropical wave that will be moving across Trinidad and Tobago tomorrow evening into Wednesday. Another tropical wave that will be moving across the area by the end of this week. Not a lot of rainfall is forecast across most of the country. In fact, this week, we'll be seeing the sunshine mixed in with clouds, but by the late morning through the afternoon, showers and thunderstorms developing along western coastal Trinidad. And that pattern is typical for the wet season, and we'll see that continue through this week. And something else with light winds and high moisture, we'll be seeing some funnel clown activity across Trinidad, and mainly Trinidad, but Trinidad and Tobago, it's possible. This was spotted yesterday evening. It actually got very close to the ground in Wellington Day Bay, but it did not touch down, which would make it a tornado. If you see one of these outside, head to an interior room of your house. Don't venture outside because once it touches down, it could become quite dangerous. Now shifting back to the weather, as we look to our radar, lots of scattered showers mainly to our north affecting the southern Windward Islands, but not Trinidad and Tobago. But we still could see some isolated showers tonight. Generally, variably cloudy skies with some odd showers, a low chance of a thunderstorm favoring southeastern parts of Trinidad. Minimum low temperatures between 23 and 26 degrees. And as we look to tomorrow, a variably cloudy day with the sunshine mixed in, but we could see some isolated showers and thunderstorms develop across Trinidad by the late morning through the afternoon with the threat of street or flash flooding. And for mariners, seas right now are slight to moderate waves up to 1.5 meters. Near calm and sheltered areas, we have spring tides ongoing, so mariners do need to exercise caution. And as we head through the week, you want to be keeping the umbrellas with you, especially during that late morning through afternoon period when the highest chances of rainfall is forecast, especially across the western half of Trinidad. So that includes Port of Spain, San Fernando, Chagones, and all the other major cities along western Trinidad. So walk with the umbrella as we head through this week, Rio. So Colleen, do we have instances of funnel clouds touching the ground in Trinidad? Yeah, uh, in the last five years, we've actually had five confirmed tornadoes. Uh, the one in 2021 damaged 42 homes in the Los Los Eros area. Yes, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Remember to take cover. Don't pull out your phone yes. and start to record. Interior room of your home, away from windows. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Colleen. And just after this break, Mark Besant brings us a special report on what he uncovered, as 106 acres of land is the center of a dispute in Peparo. <laughs> Last night, we brought you part one of this special report about a contentious land dispute in the Preparo area over 106 acres of land. In part two, Mark Bassant tells us what he uncovered in the sale of the land and how other landowners want to ensure they are not pushed out of their property. For almost two and a half years, the Swamp family and other families have been locked in a land dispute with businessman Kenrick Nannan and another relative of Central Stone Limited. The Swalts allege that they have faced their fair share of intimidation, with it intensifying over the last few months as they stand their ground. They claim a man in this video earlier this year tried to intimidate them. Vanessa Schwab says since the 80s, that purchased 
Tenny Casablan in the life of area on lot 47. This is one of our deeds dating back since in 1989 because this is my grandparents' property. Rookman Rampasad and Jaikaran Rampasad. So this has been in the family since the 80s. Right? And this has our cadastral sheet, which shows clearly that we own 10 acres of land. Right? That is this block here. Surrounding it, there are properties owned by other, other people as well. So there are other landowners who are affected by this issue as well. Mr. Mohammed, who didn't want to speak on camera, said apart from the deeds and the cadastral in his possession, his grandparents were given nearly 20 acres of land from the Crown since the 1940s. He showed us 5.5 acres of the land he owns that his family inherited from the Crown that was originally owned by the Euros Oil Company, with Hamel Smith overseeing their business since then. Mohammed said his cousins owned lots 156 to 158, that each had five acres of land on it, and it was on the southern side of his land. Like the Schwabs, he too filmed an encounter while sitting in his van the last month with the same man who allegedly intimidated the Swabs. Who are you? Who are you? You know who are you? 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 Who are he says he wants them to stop claiming what is not theirs and is calling for someone with a wise head to intervene in this matter. Although Lennon did not respond to us, we were able to do a search of his company, Central Stone Limited and the Ministry of Legal Affairs, and found documents that he had in fact, in July of 2020, purchased from Seamus Hamel Smith and Patrick Hamel Smith 11 lots of land that was approximately 66 acres in and around the Lightfoot Trace in Peparo. The land was purchased for $350,000 but he didn't own all the land. The witnesses to this deed and the deed of conveyance were attorney Vidya Gayadeen Gopi Singh, former UNC MP for Orupuch West, and another person we chose not to identify. On July 20th, Mrs. Gayadeen Gopi Singh contacted us after we had visited the area and said she had filed certain legal action. She promised to speak with us with the interest of getting Mr. Nanan's side of the story, who is allegedly related to her. On July 21st, we sent her a WhatsApp message which she read, asking if she could speak on the record. However, she only answered the following day to indicate legal action had been taken against one of the families for libel and slander and wanted to know how to proceed. CNC3 News indicated to her this matter dealt with the land issue and we would send her a full list of questions and videos and pictures on Monday, July 25th about the land matter and whether proper documentation could be provided of Mr. Nannan's purchase. But despite repeated calls and WhatsApp messages up to August 2nd, Ms. Gayadeen Gopi Singh failed to answer. During our investigation, what we found was interesting when comparing Lot 47, which was owned by the Schwab, according to their deed, on Nanan's cadastral, it indicated that Lot 46 with nine acres was known as Lot 47. The same, it seemed, belonged to the Schwalz, who were also confused when told of the discovery. CNC3 News contacted Hamelsmith's conveyance department on August 3rd and 4th, hoping to get some clarity from them about Nanan's purchase and an explanation about the sale of the lots and if there was possibly any kind of mix-up. We explained what was needed and given the assurance by an employee they would contact us, but to date they have not. Only the last two and a half weeks following CNC3's investigation and after almost two years of raising queries about the issue with the Prince of Tongue Regional Corporation, they responded via a letter on July 22nd to Vanessa Schwab saying they saw no validity in her claims of damage to their property and harassment and indicated that any work that was done there was undertaken under the remit of the Princess Song Regional Corporation. In the letter, they also stated, additionally, no work was done on any private establishment within Lightfoot Trace Peparov, nor was any request for same ever made. Mr. Gwari Rupnarayan, who spoke to us via phone last week, said that a request had been made via a letter either by Mrs. Vidya Gayadin Gopi Singh or a relative to grade down Lightfoot Trace with the corporation's assistance. He said they used the motor grader to work on Lightfoot Trace, which is under the jurisdiction of the PTRC, but never assisted in any private work. Mr. Rupnarain said he sent in surveyors to the area and said Lightfoot Trace did not belong to anyone, but was maintained by the PTRC. He said the lands surrounding the trace were another matter altogether and outside the PTRC's jurisdiction. He said based on the information he got was that Central Stone Limited under Mr. Nanan brought in a private excavator that was not connected to the PTRC but warned them not to trifle with property overseen by the PTRC, 
Rup Narayan said he had spoken to the parties that may have been responsible for erecting that iron barricade across Life for Trace and said it needed to be removed as soon as possible as it impeded access out of the area in case of any emergency. We reached out to Princess Song MP Barry Padarath about the situation via WhatsApp and he indicated, Mr. Basan, that is a private matter between those named. I have no jurisdiction to get involved and or to conduct any investigation. The powers of the Office of Member of Parliament does not afford me such. For the families living in Light for Trace, Peparo, and for others who own farming land, they're faced with a land dilemma they hope can be amicably resolved between all parties so they can resume their normal lives. Mark Basant, CNC3 News. Most centenarians are willing to share their secret to a long life, but Telma Clark has many secrets. Miss Clark, also known as Moms, Auntie Telma, Tante Telma, and Sister Clark, celebrated her 100th birthday yesterday, becoming the country's latest centenarian. And according to Miss Clark, the secrets to longevity are fear of God, good food, and ground provisions such as dashin, cassava, sweet potatoes, edos, and yam, callaloo, cuckoo, fish, lettuce, Cressels, also known as watercress, and peace of mind. She says it is God's mercy, faithfulness, and goodness that has kept her for all these years. On a special day, Auntie Telma got a visit from the Minister of Social Development and Family Services. Miss Clark told the minister that her favorite verses are from Psalm 34, verses 1 to 4. Her favorite scripture is Psalm 23, and her favorite saying is, Do what is right because. It is the right thing to do. Great advice there. Happy birthday, Tanti Telma. Now it's time to recap our headlines. A caregiver at the St. Jude's home for girls is ambushed during a daring attempt to escape. And scrap iron dealers strongly reject government's plan to temporarily shut down the industry. We've come to the end of the 7 p.m. news this evening. Tonight, we leave you with a look at the final day of Jose in St. James and St. Clair, shot by camera woman Crystal James.